Rock and Stone, my fellow kin, welcome to the video debut of the Votan vs. 40k channel, where every week I'll be releasing videos reviewing a couple of top performing competitive leagues of Votan lists, analyzing game matchups, and just providing hobby updates on where I am at with my own competitive list design. For today's debut video, we're going to be examining the top Votan placing list at the Winter Assault ITC major event at Everwinter US. The Votan list was piloted by Drew Salzborn, who took 5th out of 74 players ending the event with a four wins and one loss streak. Matches included a round one 91 to 44 win against Drukari, a 100 to 60 point win versus Tau for game two, 90 to 40 game versus Chaos Knights, a round four loss of 61 to 73 against Chaos Space Marines, and a final game victory of 75 to 50 against Chaos Knights again. Let's take a look at the list brought to this event and contextualize some of the matchups. All right, so starting the list off, we have three Ionier champions, two of which are running the Hammer, and the other one is running a Dark Star Axe. The champion that has the Dark Star Axe is also taking the enhancement of Appraising Glare, obviously for the token economy of getting more Judgment tokens out on the board. Uh, something you'll notice a lot with this list is that there's basically just three of everything. It's super small and super elite, uh, but more specifically, for the third choice of that type typically the loadout will be different and there's a very specific reason for that and that's because with a list like this when it's so elite you really need to maximize the effectiveness of all of your units and every unit has to go into that game with a dedicated role you need to go onto the table and know exactly which unit's going to be doing what and where you need to be putting it so we'll look at that in a little bit more detail as we move through the list so each of these characters are accompanying their own five-man squad of Hearthguard, and these are all running uh, gauntlets and disintegrators across the board. So really solid options here. Um, obviously, they gain a lot of value coming out of the Land Fortress, because if you get out of a Land Fortress and the Land Fortress shoots, the target that just disembarked gets reroll wounds. Um, and that's obviously great when you have something that gives devastating wounds, because it allows you to fish for more opportunities to score those devastating wounds to your target. I do believe there's been some analysis done uh, that shows mathematically the gauntlets typically outperform the plasma uh, fists or the blades especially when it's into um, higher toughness targets which we typically do see in this meta um, so you can't really go wrong with concussion gauntlets as a, as a choice here as for the hecaton land fortresses that the three units of hearthguard are riding inside of uh, we see two of them are equipped with the same loadout so that would be the heavy magma rail cannon uh, in addition to the twin bolt cannon and I, I think it's a really interesting choice at first when i was reading this i was a little surprised to see that that was the choice made for these vehicles uh furthermore to that the third land raider which has a cyclic ion cannon uh really took me by surprise because uh, that's generally considered to be the worst or one of the worst loadouts you could take for the land fortress but the more I looked at it, I, I kind of understood the thought process going into this and into the list design and why these are actually pretty solid choices when you make such an elite list like this. You see, typically the variance of the Magma Rail Rifle is obviously really spiky, right? It's super swingy because at the end of the day, it's only one shot. Yeah, it's Ballistic Skull 4, which goes to 3 with a token. And, you know, it's a big gun at Strength 18, minus 4, D6 plus 6 damage with Devastating Wounds. But at the end of the day, it's just one shot, and that's really unreliable. So you can either end up doing zero damage all game, or you could nuke something completely off the table. And I said that I was expecting to see an SP conversion beamer because I feel like it has the most average and well-rounded output. It's two shots, so you get double the amount of shots. It's ballistic skill four, which goes to three with a token. It's strength 10, so still pretty high. Minus 2 AP, it's 4 damage, but what's really nice is that it has conversion. So basically on an unmodified hit roll of 4+, plus, you get sustain hits D3. So you could pretty reliably generate additional shots. So like I feel on average, you're probably going to be producing around 3 or 4 shots uh, a turn with that instead, which is obviously pretty good. Um, so I, I was a little weirded out to see the, the Magma Rail Cannon here, which is usually considered a little bit more of a, of a meme choice. But looking at the elite nature of this list as a whole, we see a huge trade-off was made with the Sagittar specifically in order to accommodate this weirder loadout on the Hecatons. So let me explain. Like Usually, 
we would expect to see the Hilas equipped on these smaller transports, on the Sagittars, because you know, while they're less consistent than the missile launcher, they have a huge possibility of spiking. So when we dilute our list with a lot of Sagittars, typically you'll see four to six in a list, we essentially increase the probability of getting a high damage shot on one of their guns, so more value. You almost guarantee that at least once around with six Sagittars, you'll get a good damage shot that goes through. In this case, however, the pilot opted to instead place the variants on the Hecatons instead, who have the potential to do 100% more damage with a single shot. You know, it's, it's a minimum of seven damage if it goes through because it's D6 plus six. And to balance out that anti-tank variance, he instead puts the missile launchers on the Sagittors because he wants to guarantee the reliable three damage a wound gun. Likewise, because there are only three Sagittors total, the chances of spiking on their Hylas, like I said before, are much lower. You only have half the number of Sagittors that are running around, you're probably not going to get a good spike, and if you do get a spike in this game, you'd much rather have it on the Hecaton's gun because it does 100% more damage with a shot. So I think that a choice was made here to average the number of output shots you get on a Sagittar, make it more consistent, more reliable, and then with your Land Fortress, you go all in on doubling down across two of them for that variable high-risk shot that has the potential to blow something up. I think this decision really shines in an elite list like this because you need to maximize the effectiveness of all your units, given that they are worth so much more to you. If you lose one model or one unit here, you're going to feel it. And so you really want to make sure that you've designed your units to be able to statistically give you the most value that they can on the table and optimize what damage they could do into specific targets. So that's for the Magma Rail Cannon, but on a very similar note to the Cyclic Ion Cannon, just looking through the stats here, um, I believe it was also taken in order to maximize the utility here. Uh, in this case, the Ion Tank becomes his answer to any large unit-sized uh, infantry or um, you know just, just hordes in general because he does have D6 plus three shots with Blast. Uh, and so the other vehicles are designed in this list to kind of optimize the anti-tank weaponry. And I think this one, he's going for more of the infantry front. Just you get onto an objective, there's someone there, you got to clear them out, use this tank. Another interesting choice here are the three squads of Berserks. So two of them are equipped with mauls and the other one carries axes. This is the same thought process, I believe, as with the Dark Axe Champion and the Ion Cannon Land Fortress. You have dedicated units for dedicated jobs. You keep these guys in the Sagittars, you bring the axes to any max-sized light medium toughness infantry models and you keep the hammers for clearing out any elite threats that could be on the border on an objective lastly we have a squad of three thunderkin these guys are equipped with bolt cannons this is again another interesting choice because we really don't see this too often typically if someone does bring thunderkin which in my opinion underperform on the table um, they're always equipped with grav cannons and they come out of reserves to compensate for your short range. So you really want to just bring these guys on from reserves and they shoot one thing, maybe they kill it, and then they die. It's 75 points. It keeps your opponent honest. I don't think they're a bad choice, but I, I don't think they necessarily do as much damage as people think they would do. In this case, he's taking the bolt cannons, which again, took me by surprise because now you're no longer pursuing that same role. I think with the Broker Thunderkin, he's looking to keep these 30 inch range guns on his home objective. So you keep these guys there. They're pretty tough. They're T6. They have decent shooting. You keep them there with cover, you know, maybe armor of contempt or sorry, void armor. And uh, they're going to be tough to get through. So just a decent objective holding unit for 75 points that has pretty okay shooting into things that would likely threaten your backfield that you don't want to necessarily send your hearth guard or your berserks to take care of. So one thing I would be curious to learn about uh, for the decision making is why he decided not to carry this trend forward of one in three units taking a different loadout to the hearth guard squads. Um, I would have expected to see with this trend that we would have one group of hearth guard carry the, um, the plasma gauntlets instead. Um, and I would think that this unit would go inside of the cyclic ion hecaton with the champion who has the Dark Star Axe. So just a dedicated 
unit to take out anything that's medium to light infantry. An argument could be made that maybe the gauntlets are just statistically better than anything you would want to attack with the plasma blades, but still something I'd be curious about seeing or hearing an explanation as to why. I mentioned earlier that I really like this list because you kind of look at it and you can immediately tell why each unit is included with its weapon choice and what the list wants to do. A list like this needs to be aggressive. It has to be dominant on primary, so you send in redundant waves to each contested objective. Maybe you scout move the Sagittars into position, turn one you disembark the Berserks, and you keep them in some nearby ruins, just ready to charge any objective that might have a, a compatible threat on it. Something light, maybe for the Plasma Axe, or if you need to go heavier into Elite, you bring the Concussion Malls there. And once that's dealt with, you roll in the Hecatons, and you unload your squads of Hearthguard to reroll devastating wound rolls. And on top of that, the fists are there to ensure that anything in combat basically just melts to them. You also have the champion attached nearby, who's providing a reliable reroll to your charges and just extra damage on the uh, on the charge. And then lastly, just to round it off, you got your three broke your thunderkin. They're sitting on the home objective. Um, you got them chilling in the back. They got decent range on their guns. They're pretty durable as well. And then you have that redundancy, that staying power with your vehicles, your heavily mechanized list. Just these really tough bodies with a lot of wounds that sit on an objective. They could do the um, the charge with the mortals and they could sit there and just be a, a nuisance for your opponent. Overall, just a very tough and mean list to deal with. So to finish our analysis, I just kind of wanted to look at some positives and some limitations that you might see with a list like this if you were thinking of running it. So I think for a positive, right off the bat, it's an extremely durable roster of units that you have here. Everything is really tough to get through. You got excellent redundancy with three of three. You just keep sending in these waves to every objective you want. You also have clear unit rolls. Everything has a very specific use in your army and you know exactly what it has to do. It's an aggressive and fast list. Everything is in transports. Everything gets to where it has to go. And it's really strong into elite armies, which I think we're going to get to see when we look at the matchups. In addition to that, it's also a threat overload list. What do you shoot at? Do you shoot at the Hearthguard that are threatening your infantry? Do you focus everything onto the Hecatons and maybe kill them because they're threatening your vehicles? Just a lot of things going on. When we look at limitations or some weaknesses of the army here, um, obviously it's very elite. So as a result of being very elite, you have less board presence. That also kind of means you got to commit to being in one place and everything has that specific role. So you can't afford to really have things be action monkeys unless you're well positioned to do so. Now, a similar limitation with being an elite army is that you have very limited screening. If somebody wants to threaten your backfield objective, and threaten your broke here, I think they could very easily do so with a list like this unless you decide to keep one of your Berserk squads a little closer to your home objective. As I said earlier, it's a really aggressive list, but I think you need to know when to be aggressive and when you shouldn't be. A list like this, any mistake could have a significant impact on the chances of you winning, and you need to know when it's a good move to be the aggressor or when you need to wait and then capitalize on an opportunity or a mistake your opponent makes. I think another limitation is that you pretty easily give up fixed secondaries here. Um, you know, just bring it down, for example. You could max that out. Uh, and additionally to that, maybe if somebody takes behind enemy lines um, with the reduced screening, they could pretty reliably get that too. All right, now that we had a chance to look at the list, let's jump into some of the matchups here and talk about how this list plays at the tournament. So... Looking at the first game here, Voltan 91 to Drukari 44. I don't have a ton of experience playing with Drukari or against Drukari, um, but the general consensus is that they're fairly underpowered right now. I do think Voltan in general is pretty good into Drukari in their current state. I mean, who isn't? But I do think they're particularly good into Drukari in their current state because they have a lot of anti-vehicle shooting that does a lot of damage with high AP and... They also have incredible infantry killing capabilities. And, and they're very fast in a list like this. They have a lot of staying power. So if Drukari doesn't have the killing potential to remove you from that objective, 
you're just going to sit there all day. And they can't really do anything about that. So I think in a game like this, you absolutely decimate your opponent on primary. And for secondaries, I'm not sure if you go fixed or tactical, because again, I'm not sure what most Drukhari armies are running, if they're a character heavy or not. But I would imagine because you can dominate so easily against an army like this on primary, you could afford to go tactical secondaries here and maybe use a Sagittar or two to go ahead and do those uh, secondary actions. So for game two against Tau, I think this is a very good matchup for Voltan as well. Um, typically in a Tau list, you'll see a couple huge bricks of crisis suits, maybe a smaller sized one, and then a couple threats. So I think you just take your judgment tokens, you put it on the big unit of crisis suits, you pick out the next scary thing that comes at you or that will be coming at you, and you, you quite easily deal with it. Um, I think especially with the Hearthguard unit coming out, getting a charge into the Crisis Suit, or even just tank shocking the crisis, the crisis Suits, and then having your infantry disembark and then charge in so that they don't get overwatched. I, I do think you have a lot of value in, in a list designed like this, just because you could sit and park on an objective, and if the Tau player commits to that one objective to take you off of it, and terrain is good, they will need to put themselves in a disadvantageous position where then you could quickly get there with your vehicles, your mechanized list, disembark, and then send in your troops. Going on to game three here, Chaos Knights. I think this is also a favorable matchup for Voltan, uh, particularly, like I said, with Tau, because they have very clearly identified threats on the board. They're an elite army as well. And like I said, in my list analysis, I think this list is very well into elites because you pick out your four judgment tokens and then you literally just send all your anti-tank into them. If they get close to you with armatures, you disembark your hearth guard and you just kill them. The list runs a lot of anti-tank weaponry, um, especially with the melee capabilities and outputs. I don't think there's much of a struggle into a list like this. Where I do think the list would have some difficulties is into armies that are a little more on the hoardy side. And so we do see something like this happen with game four here against Chaos Space Marines. Chaos Space Marines right now are a really strong army. They have amazing stat lines, just really well-costed units, maybe a little under-costed, um, and they do a lot. And so I think with Voltan having too many threats to, to identify on the table or to pick out, especially if you're running an elite list like this where you need to dedicate your army to just a few key targets to get the most output from your units, I, I think it's a little tougher for, for Voltan to keep up here with just the sheer number of things Chaos Space Marines could throw at you in a game like this. And it was still very close, a 61-73 to 73 game. But I do kind of see why Chaos Space Marines would be able to take the lead against a Voltan list designed like this. For the last game of Voltan for this event, we see Voltan 75 points to Chaos Knights 50 points. And I forgot to mention this with the first Chaos Knights game, but I do feel in a matchup like that, you can again grab fixed secondaries if you would like. And I think you'll get some really good success doing so because they're really elite and you're really fast. So you just have to kill for bring it down, and then you just have to drive your vehicles to the different quadrants of the table or to behind enemy lines. And I think you get some really nice points scored that way. So wrapping the video up here, um, I just, you know, I want to see it again. Looking at the matchups here, I do think this list is favored against elite armies. So, you know, for Tau-ish, Chaos Knights especially, I think these are really solid matchups. Like I said, judgment tokens, redundancies, you're very durable. Your opponent wants to come to you. Sure thing. They come to you, you they punch you, you survive because you're very strong, and then you counter punch them because everything has layers in your army. They attack your vehicle, there's people inside your vehicle. They destroy that first wave, you send in an even tankier vehicle with even stronger units inside. You just pick three objectives, you grab them, you hold them, and you win on primary really solid list. I think it's a ton of fun to play. I don't have the units to play this, but I would love to try something like this. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this review. If you did like this kind of content, please do leave a like down below and subscribe for more regular Voltan coverage. Uh, what did you think of the list we covered today? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.